Before I start, I'll pray. Bow your head and close your eyes, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here today safely. Thank you for getting us through the week and helping me to prepare a sermon for this Sabbath. Uh, be in my mouth and give me the words to speak. And humble me and humble everybody in this room so we can understand your message and consume it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. My sermon is called The Value of a Soul. The Value of a Soul. All right. Turn to Matthew 24, please, and verse 3. Matthew 24 and verse 3. And we'll be reading from verses 3 to 14. All right. Now, what's going to happen here is disciples ask Jesus, uh, when's, when, what's going to be like before you come back? And also the, uh, the, the same question they ask is, when's this temple going to be destroyed? Because he mentioned that. So he's answering them in two different ways. But we're going to focus on the end time implication, okay? He says in verse 3, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be? When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many, of, many shall be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That gospel of the kingdom is the three angels' message. Most of y'all knew that, right? Yeah. Right? What's the first thing the three angels' message, the first angels' message, in all three of them, what's the first thing it tells us to do? Before that. Everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. If you, well, well, you can't tell someone to fear God if they don't have a reason to, right? Fear God. Why? Well, because he died for your sins. That's why. Then they have a reason to fear God. You understand? And if you fear God, you'll give glory to God. If you glory to him, then you can learn about everything else that comes into it. You understand? But first comes with your character and why you should change. So I'm going to talk about that today in connection with the third angel's message, the everlasting gospel. All right. Do you know why the gospel is everlasting? You can't answer me. You know what? I, I like that, but other than other than because it's everlasting, wh why why would it be called? Why do you call it that? It, it does never change. Never. The there you go. It goes all the way that way, all the way this way. Yes. Preordained. Remember, Jesus was a lamb preordained. All right. Now, First Peter, chapter one and verse twelve. It reads. And to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit. Hold on, my bad. With the Holy Ghost, set down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. It's talking about the gospel. Angels desire to look into this. So it's a mystery even to them. All right? It's a lovely mystery, but they're still going, to, they're still studying it, and they never, they never got it. And we're down here, we're supposed to be preaching it, and, uh, you know, for all eternity, we're still going to be looking into it, same way they are. Why would he do that? And what makes it more, um, what, make, what gives it a more meaning to us, or what should give it more meaning to us, Spirit of Prophecy and the Bible tell us that there's countless worlds out there. God got all of that, and he has all the angels, right? And he came to die for this one little planet when he has all of this already. Why would he want to do that? You look up in space, right? You see all those stars? A star is a sun. That means there's planets around it, and that's, you, you can't even count them. God got countless worlds, but he died for, uh, for this planet if just one person would accept him. Matter of fact, he died for this planet if no one would accept him. He would have still died for this planet. All right? Spirit of Prophecy says, Satan in heaven had hated Christ for his position in the courts of God. He hated him more when he, had, when he himself was dethroned. He hated him who pledged himself to redeem a race of sinners. Yet into this world where Satan claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come. A helpless babe, subject to weakness of humanity, he permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it, at the risk of failure and eternal loss. So was it a risk for God to come here and die? 
It was a risk. It was a big risk. That was God, right? Is Jesus God? Oh, I don't have all the um, references, but this one I do. Desire of Ages, 49, 1. All right. All of them I don't have because I copy-pasted it, so y'all know. So it was a big risk. At the risk of failure, that means that God could have failed. And if God failed, remember what he's doing, right? He's turning to a human being. And human beings have sinful nature. They're born sinful. That means they can die. And Jesus did die. So if he came down there and he, and he tried to live a holy life and he failed somehow and he sinned, that means he would be dead. And that means that no one else could help you, right? And I don't know what else. Would, I don't know if that happened. What they would have did. I don't know if God the Father would have to come down and die, or Holy Spirit would come. To, I don't know what they would have did. But if it didn't work, God would have died, and that would put all of heaven in peril. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us. So, to get into that, to illustrate the points I'm trying to make, we're going to look at the relationship between the Father and the Son before anything was created. All right, point one is there are two distinct individuals. There are two distinct individuals, two different people. In John 17, verse 5, it says, And the glory which thou gavest me I had, have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. He calls the Father and the Son are we. That's two different people. And Genesis 1, 26 says, Let us go down and make man our own image. Ella White tells us in the Review and Herald, June 1st, 1905, but the unity that is to exist between Christ and his follow followers does not destroy the personality of either. So it looks like Jesus has a personality of his own. God the Father has a personality of his own. And the Holy Spirit has a personality of his own. I'm not going to talk about the Holy Spirit in this sermon, but I do believe in the Holy Spirit. But I'm not talking about him in this sermon. Just the Father and the Son. They have different personalities. They're different people. Okay? Now, because they are so intimately joined, the Father and Son are described as being one. All right? It's a mystery, but it's not a mystery. Because when two people get married, they're described as being one, right? But they're two people. But because they're intimately enjoined, it's like they're, being, it's like they're one. Their mind or everything about them is supposed to be one, but they're different people. Same thing with God, the Father, and God the Son. John 10.30 says, I and my Father are one. And on the white states, from eternity, there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. They are two, yet little short of being identical, two in individuality yet one in spirit and heart and character. Point three is the Father and the Son are both equally God. Both equally God. It's not the Father is the big God, then Jesus is the little God, then the Holy Spirit is the smallest God. They take different roles, but they're all equally God. Okay? John 1, 1 to 2 states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not was God of a little j, but for big j. The same was in the beginning with God. On the white states, God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are open to his Son. And Ellen White also tells us, The Savior was the brightness of his Father's glory and the express image of his person. He possessed divine majesty, perfection, and excellence. He was equal with God. So it's clear that Jesus was equal with God. Not other denominations believe that, but he was equal with God, or he, wasn't be, he would never be able to come die for us. It wouldn't mean nothing. Point four is there is a special intimacy between the Father and the Son described as being in the Father's bosom. And that's just a term to mean that you're really close, okay, in the bosom. John 1, 18 states, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And Ella White tells us, His beloved Son, full of grace and truth, to come to a world of indescribable glory, I mean, my bad, to come to a world of indescribable glory, to a world marred and blighted with sin, shadowed with the shadow of death and curse, he permitted him to leave the bosom of his love, the adoration of the angels, to suffer shame, insult, humiliation, hatred, and death. Now keep in mind, when I say the bosom, we think about it in a human way. These people have uh, been there since forever. God the Father and God the Son. You had to give, he had to give up the thing he loved the most in everything. Somebody that was equal with him, that was him, but not him. You understand? This person was like his, his, his number two, his go-to guy, always was there with him, always by his side. He had to let him go. And he knew what would happen when he let him go. He knew it. And the Son knew what would happen. It was not an easy thing to do. He didn't just say, I know I'll just go die for them. And say, okay, let's go do it. It wasn't like that. 
we got we to gotta remember these things when preaching and teaching people. Next, Jesus is the express image of his Father. And the White tells us, the Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen men. He was of as much more value than man as his noble, spotless character and exalted office as commander of all the heavenly hosts were above the work of man. He was in the express image of his Father, not in features alone, but a perfection of character, in the express image, in perfection and character, and it says in, per, and in uh, appearance, too. So they looked alike. Now, in the Bible, in the Hebrew, there's two different words they use that they translate in the image. God, was, we made, God made us in his image, right? And the two words are almost interchangeable. We keep seeing them back and forth. In the Hebrew, one is akon, which, mean, is, which would mean like relating to uh, the way you look. All right, you're made in God's image. You look like him. You got two arms, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, two legs. The next one is haraten, which means uh, image as in like the, the relationship. Notice he made man in his image. They just make one. He made two of them, right? It's going to reflect God's relationship with his son will reflect Adam's relationship with Eve. All right? We'll get into that. And also... Haratan can refer to character, all right, the way you are. So God didn't just make man. He made man in his character also. Man was born or uh, created with a sinless character. All right. The father and the son are composed of the same substance. Whatever makes the father God makes the son God. All right. Philippians 2.6 tells us, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Talking about Jesus. And Ellen White tells us, the words of Christ were full of deep meaning as he put forth the claim that he and the Father were one substance, possessing the same attributes. The Jews understood his meaning. There was no reason why they shouldn't, why they shouldn't misunderstand. Uh, my bad. But there was no reason why they should misunderstand. And they took up stones to stone him. Jesus looked upon them calmly and unshrinkingly and said, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these do you stone me? She also tells us Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense, in the highest sense. He was with God from eternity, God all over, blessed forevermore. Next is the glory of Christ is the glory of the Father shining through him. All right, does Christ have his own glory? Can Christ have his own glory? He's God, could he? He could because he's God, but doesn't. he doesn't. He lets the Father's glory shine through him. See, he takes a lesser role on purpose. Hebrews 1, verse 3 tells us, Who being in the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, Christ was in the brightness of God's glory, the Father. Ella White tells us, He who was one with the Father before the world was made, had such compassion for a world lost that he and ruined by transgression that he gave his life a ransom for it. He, wa he who was in the brightness of the Father's glory, so was he in the brightness of the Father's glory before he came to earth? Yes. All right. It wasn't a, I'm, I'm a man now, so now I'm in the brightness of the Father's glory. He was like that before. Now, yeah, so we're going to get to that right here. They were both obviously equal, yet Christ took a subordinate role. Okay? 1 Corinthians 11.3 tells us, The head of Christ is God. Ellen White tells us, The great creator assembled the heavenly host and um, I don't have the reference for this one but I do think it's in the book um, uh, it's the one they wrote before Patriots and Prophets she took a lot of this stuff from that book and wrote Patriots and Prophets with it, the spirit of prophecy I think that's what, no, his story of redemption story of redemption, the great creator assembled the heavenly host that he might in the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son the son was seated on the throne with the father and heavenly throngs of holy angels were gathered around them the Father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his Son, should be equal with himself, so that wherever the presence of his Son, it was his own presence. The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. His Son, he had invested with authority. If you invest somebody with authority, do they have authority over you? Or do you have authority over them? If you give somebody else authority. You have authority over them. So the Father gave authority to his Son, after he just, after Ellen White just told us that they were equal. So they are equal, but one somebody has authority over the other, right? To command the heavenly host, especially was his son to work in union with himself 
in the anten ant um, anticipated creation of the earth and every living thing that should exist upon the earth. His son will carry out his will and his purposes. If you carry out someone else's will and purposes, that means you're underneath of them, right? But would do nothing of himself alone. The, father, the father's will would be fulfilled in him. 1 Corinthians 15, 28 also tells us, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, the Father, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be in all in all. It's clear in Scripture that the Son took a subordinate role, yet he was still equal with God. Now, in Genesis, we have the story of the creation, right? And God says, Let us make man in our image. I talked about this earlier. And I'm going to show you how he said, I'll make man in my image in you know, character in the way they look, but also in our relationship. Father, in the sense that let us make man in our image, the relationship will be the same with man. And the first thing we'll look at is there were two distinct individuals, male and female, he created them both, okay? That's clear because there's a man and there's a woman and they're two distinct individuals, even though nowadays Satan's trying to mix it up. They're both two, but one. Remember, when a, a man will leave his uh, mother and father and cleave his wife, and there'll be one flesh. They were equal, right? They're both human beings, right? They're both equal. Now, the white says that Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal. Now, question. She said not to control him as the head, or be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but did she ever say not to be subordinate? No, she said not to be trampled under his feet. That's different than be subordinate, because Christ was never trampled under the feet of God. But he wasn't over God's head, right? They both had a close, intimate relationship described as being in the bosom. Deuteronomy 13.6 describes people who are close to us as being in their bosom. And Eve was also created out of the side of Adam, right? Isn't that close to him? They probably had the closest relationship that anybody's ever had on the face of the earth as a couple because she was made out of his body. Ella White tells us, a part of man's bone, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. For no man has ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and shares it. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. So also, that goes for people that like to be rude or disrespectful or beat on their spouse. You're really beating on yourself and being disrespectful to yourself. You're saying that you don't like yourself or you don't love yourself when you don't love your spouse because you're one flesh. The Bible says no man hates his own flesh. So why would you do that to somebody that you consider your own flesh? Understand? All right, they are of the same substance. Just read that in that same quote, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Now, the seventh, some people have problems with these last two, but it's, but it's biblical. And it's in this very prophecy. Woman is the glory of man. First Corinthians eleven seven states, but woman is the glory of man. Okay? And lastly, Adam and Eve were both equal, but Eve was subordinate. In Genesis three twenty, Adam named Eve. How's that what's that mean? Why why would I say that? Well then Adam named all the plants. Then Adam named all the animals, right? God gave him the meaning of the earth and he named everything. Mm -hmm. When you name something, you have authority over it. And he named Eve. All right, but that does not mean that she was supposed to be some slave or he tells her what to do or he beats her around. It's not like that. It means that there's somebody has to run something. You understand? And it, it's just like heaven. People think that oh that doesn't like it's not like that on earth no more. We don't gotta do it like that. Well, why would they do it in heaven still to this day? Why is the father coming? Why is the son coming to the father? You know, in Daniel we read that the son, the son came to the father and the father gave him authority. Then the judgment happens. He had to come to the Father first. Still, same thing on earth, all right? Equal but different roles. All right, what was Eve's sin, guys? What was Eve's sin? Be specific with the sin. I know she disobeyed God. That's, that's sin. But what was her sin, specifically? To rise above. To rise above. To be, to be like God. There you go. For one, is she acted independently from Adam. All right? Acted independently from Adam. <clears throat> Next is she desired to ascend to the place of God. All right? Two things. And all of that, go, and I, I like what you said earlier about the appetite. 
That was appetite. She desired to be to the place of God. She didn't eat the fruit because it just really looked good. It did look good. All the fruit looked good in the whole garden. You know, the shri that, Ellen White tells us in the book Confrontation, did that tree that look uglier or more beautiful than any other tree? The tree was only special because God said don't eat from it. That's the only reason. So she ate from it because of that reason, because she desired to be in the place of God. She didn't understand what the serpent was really saying when he told her that you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He lied, but didn't lie. It's called deception. Ellen White tells us the angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occup occupied in their daily labor in the garden. With him, she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task and unconsciously wandered from Adam's side, she soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and adoration upon the forbidden tree. The fruit was very beautiful, and she questioned with herself why God had withheld it from them. Now was the tempter's opportunity. You know this also. If God had made that tree more beautiful or more ugly, they would have a reason or an excuse of why they ate from it. Why well, ate from that tree? Because you just made it look so good and told us not to eat from it but didn't have that excuse. God said it looked like every other tree. It's almost like the Sabbath. Doesn't the Sabbath seem like any other day? Why is it special? Because God made it holy. But can you see the holiness? No. But it is holy because God made it holy. So worshiping on Sunday, does it, well, I worship on Sunday. Well, that, like, that's like when they ate from the tree. All right? For, it's the same thing. It's funny how that's the first test, and the Sabbath thing will be the final test, and they go together so well. Amen. What was Adam's sin? What was Adam's sin? He wasn't deceived, by the way. No. What was his sin? He had such a love for Eve. I like that. He was unwilling to give up the most special thing in his life. I say that because God wasn't the most special thing in his life at that point. Right. Eve was. Or he would have just stepped back and let God had to do what he had to do. Mm. I don't know why I tell this. This is talking about Adam. He mourned that he permitted Eve to wander from his side. So it looked like he was going to let Eve leave. And if you permit somebody to do something, you have authority over them, right? Just trying to put all these points into what I'm saying. But now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? Adam had enjoyed the companionship of God and the holy angels. He understood the high destiny of the human race, which was to replace the angels that left heaven. Should they remain faithful to God? Yet all these blessings were lost sight of in the fear of losing that one gift, which in his eyes overvalued every other. Love, gratitude, loyalty for, for the Creator, all were overborne by love for Eve. She was a part of himself, and he could not endure the thought of separation. He couldn't give up Eve at the risk of losing her forever. Now, what's that got to do with the father and the son? Well, it's, they did the opposite. The son wanted to descend, not ascend. Eve wanted to ascend and not descend. Philippians 2, 5 to 8 tells us, turn there to us. Philippians 5, I mean, my bad. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. This is a verse I really like, so I want to turn there. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. And it reads, that this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. And he was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He did the, he did the opposite of what Eve did. Now, Eve also wanted from Adam's side. She went independently from Adam. Christ never acted independently of the Father, but always did only the will of the Father. Remember his prayer? Not my will, but let your will be done. Right? Now what about the Father? And the White tells us, Before the Father, he pleaded, that Jesus, pleaded in the sinner's behalf, while the host of heaven awaited the result with an intensity of interest that words cannot express, long continued was the myster mysterious coming, oh, my bad, was the mysterious communion, the council of peace, for the fallen sons of men, the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, and Christ is the land foreordained before the foundation of the world, yet it was a struggle. It was a what? Struggle. A struggle. Even with the kings of the universe to yield up his son to die for the goatee race. So it was hard for God to give up his son to die for the race, the, uh, the human race that were uh, going to die. But God loved, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, right? But it was a struggle. 
if Jesus is pleading, that means Father didn't really like the idea too much the first time or the second time, and he had to really talk about this thing. And the Father knew who was right, and he knew he had to do it, and Jesus knew he had to do it too. But it was still a struggle because it hurts. People don't think that God gets hurt and that he doesn't have feelings. He's just a God up there that's just happy all the time. He is. He's loving and happy, but he gets hurt, and he feels sad, and he gets angry, all right? And this stuff like this, this stuff really hurt him because it's not just a human being dying, which he would be really upset over. And he's going to be upset over killing the, the devil himself. But this was God, who never sinned, who never did nothing wrong, who's going to take God's wrath. Remember, he's going to drink the cup. He's going to be getting what we all deserve when he didn't do nothing wrong. That's like, that's like you uh, killing your son for somebody that didn't do anything wrong. Say, oh, you know what? You don't got to die. I'm going to sacrifice my own son who didn't do anything so that you can live. Think about how hard would that be for you to do? I don't have a son or a daughter or anything like that, so I don't know. But for you to do, it'd be hard. No one wants to see somebody they love die, especially when they don't deserve it. Ella White tells us, God permitted his son to come, that's God the Father, permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, subject to the weakness of humanity. He was permitted to meet life's peril and common of every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it, at the risk of failure and eternal loss. So it was more of a struggle because he might fail. Why? Because humans aren't perfect beings. They're sinful. And you're going to be in a sinful body. Although you're God, you'll be in a sinful body. That means you can be tempted. If you can be tempted, there's risk that you might sin. And Jesus said, I know. But I have to, I have to, do, I have to do this. So you have to try because I love them. I don't want to see nobody die. Also, for our redemption, heaven itself is imperiled. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life, you may estimate the value of a soul. That's why I say the value of the soul is measured by the risk it took to save one soul. And the risk was everything. Okay? So think about that when you go through your daily life and you're trying to study and you're studying your Bible and you're preaching to people and you're teaching people and you're, and you're talking and you're like, we have these nice discussions. Think about the root of why you're here. If we, that, that, that's not leaving our first love. We've got to stay with our first love, right? How to remember what our first love did for us. we got to stick with it. Oh, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. We say it all the time. But we've got to stick to it. All right? Why you die for your sins? Think about the deepness of it. All right? Do you know what? You, you don't know what heaven's like. We don't. All we could do is look at the stars and just imagine. Or look at things like, you, um, I know a lot of you have probably seen pictures of the Orion's Nebula and these different nebulas in space and these galaxies. The stuff is beautiful. You, you, you look at it and you, you just wonder if it's a, a real picture at all. And heaven's more beautiful. That's what you can see. And God told us, no, you don't have no idea what's in heaven. Yeah. So if you see that and that's just, no, you have no words for it, imagine in heaven. Right? And God gave it all up to come down to this world to live for 30, 33 years and die. A horrible death and have a horrible life. It was really, it was really a horrible life. Everybody rejected him. No one wanted to listen to him from the time he was a kid. Because yeah. I don't know why people don't know he was teaching when he was like nine years old. I don't know why he tells us that they were inside there trying to tell, them, tell him about their stuff. And, and they, weren't run, they weren't really willing to learn anything. And she says if they had learned what he was saying then, it would have been a crazy revival in that day. But it wasn't because they didn't care as a kid. His whole life. And he hung out with the worst people. And they didn't, it seemed like they didn't get right till after he died. So his life was pretty bad, and his death was pretty horrible. He died friendless and alone. Not even God seemed to be there. He was, but he didn't seem to be. She also tells us, The eternal Father, the unchangeable one, gave his only begotten Son, tore from his bosom. Think about that. Tore from his bosom. Him who made... Him who was made in the express image of his person and sent down to the earth to reveal how greatly he loved mankind. He is willing to do more, more than we can ask or think, and inspire a writer to ask the question, which should sink deep into our heart. And this is the question. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Shall not every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ say, since God has done so much for us, how shall we not for Christ's sake Show our love to him by obedience to his commandments, by being doers of his word, by unreservedly consecrating ourselves to his service. See, that's the reason that we keep the commandments. That's the reason we keep the Sabbath. That's the reason we do the strangest message. Why? Because we love God. Why do we love God? Because he loved us first. And he loved us so much that he died for us. He showed it was active love. We have to have active love too. And like, like we were all talking about, sitting in church is not active love. It's nothing. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. 
Who can know the depths of love which passeth knowledge? Now, the Father and the Son made the same, faced the same decisions as Adam and Eve when it came down to it, right? But the only thing that was different is that the Father was willing to do what Adam was unwilling to do. And, and the Son was willing to come down and die at the will of his Father when Eve was not. She was willing to ascend and be God. And by the way, when, the, when Satan told him that, um, that they needed a tree, their eyes will be open, he was implying that their eyes were shut, that God had their eyes shut to something. And he's also implying that God wasn't always God. One day he ate from the tree, and he became God. And now, you can, he's keeping you from the tree, because if you eat from the tree, you'll be like God, and you don't want anybody out there to compete with him. That's what he's trying to imply by saying that. He's never trying to imply that you'll be God. He's trying to imply that you'll be like God. You'll be like good and evil. I mean, you're no good and evil. You'll be like God. And yeah, God does know good and evil. They didn't know what that meant. Satan made it in two ways. He meant it truthfully, and he meant it in a lie. Because you were no good and evil, because you'll be sinful. They didn't get it. And by the way, it was a pretty dumb mistake because the snakes that he ate from the apple, I mean, ate from the, the tree, and he wasn't God. And he was talking to her the whole time, and she didn't pick up on that. The father was willing to do what Adam wasn't, and he was unwilling to do what the son did, at the risk of eternal loss, and at the risk that God might die, and at the risk, that if, and at the risk of no one accepting his atonement. See, I told you he would have died if no one accepted him. He would have came down here and died. Why? Because it's not just us that this is about. Countless worlds out there, and there's billions of angels that are all sitting here between this whole thing looking at it, wanting to know who's right and who's wrong. Now, after Jesus died, they're pretty sure who's right. But the thing is, he's still doing it. That's, I'm going to still do it. I'm going to do this whole thing out. I'm going to take it all the way to the end, like I said I am, just to show you how much I love people and how much sin is wrong. Because sin is the opposite of love. For us, Christ gave everything up. But the most serious point is that he would run this risk for just one person. If it was just you, and we always think if it was just us, but what if it was just the person next to you? What if it was the person you hate the most? Or the person that's your worst enemy? You're the craziest sinner you know. God did it for just one person, and it, could not, and it didn't have to be just us. All right? Think of the worst person you know. God died for them. And we have to have that in mind when talking to people, when living with people, when just being around people. Because I see a lot of people in the church and in the world act the same way, without love. They make jokes at each other, crude humor. They're mean to each other. They go home and talk about the pastor, talk about each other at home. And they come back to church and smile on your faces. And, and it's just, do you forget the, the whole point of what we're doing? It's the whole point. The thir we talk about the third angel's message, but we forget about the first angel's message and the second angel's message that lead up to the third angel's message. You can't go around telling people, Sunday law, Sunday law, Sunday law, if you don't tell them the love of God and, the, and, and, and being like Jesus Christ and the teachings of God. And if you're not doing those teachings, get out of where you're from and come over here. We're doing the teachings of God. We're, whatever God's doctrines are, wherever we're doing that, come here. Then you hit them with the Sunday law stuff. And also, uh, the spirit of process is before all of that, you bring them up with the health message. You got to hook them in with that. That's the right arm of the gospel. Amen. Then you give them the gospel. See, Jesus went around healing people. Then he preached to them. And I bet you when he preached, all the people that came, I bet a lot of them were people he healed. Never said nothing to them about God or nothing like that or preached to them. Probably just came and healed them because some days he would just heal people. Just heal people. And they come and just heal them. Multitudes of people. Then opened his mouth. Just healing them. And they remembered that and they came back and they heard him preach and they accepted him. All right. On the right says this. Now this is why I want you to see that the, um, this gospel thing is not an earth heaven thing. It's a universe thing. And we've got to see the gospel in a way bigger picture than what we're seeing it. We really don't see it in a big picture. I don't feel like the, the Seventh-day Adventist church or Christians see it in a bigger picture. And that's because I feel as though we're the only church that believes there's other people out there other than us, angels, and God. There's other worlds. God created other people. And she says this. And think about these words. This world is but an atom. How small is an atom, guys? How small is an atom? You can't see it, right? This world is but an atom in the vast dominions over which God presides. Yet this little fallen world, the one lost sheep, is more precious in his sight than are all the ninety-nine that went not astray from the fold. Christ, the love commander in heavenly courts, stooped from his high estate, laid aside the glory that he had with his father in order to save the one lost world. For this he left the sinless worlds on high, the ninety-nine that loved him, and came to this earth to be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. God gave himself and his son that he might have the joy of receiving back the sheep that were lost. And I, I like how another pastor put it, a uh, pastor on audio verse named Anil Kanda. He says that there was a big map, maybe the size of this floor, the stars on the map, and it's the whole universe. 
and the angels say, hey, well, I got to go down to the earth to do something. Where's the earth at? It's not going to ever happen. They know where the earth's at, but an illustration. Where's the earth at? And they say, you see that little star right there, that teeny one that's like you can't barely see it? Yeah. Well, the earth's the little one next to that that you can't see at all. That's the earth. That's where we have to, and, and that's, how, that's really how it is. A little atom, an atom's an atom. Can you see an atom right now? Can't see it. That's how the world is the earth to the whole universe. Yet, God came to die for one person less than an atom. Christ made himself less than an atom to go die for somebody that's less than an atom. That, that could be nothing to him. That's how great his love is. He could have said, oh, earth, and it's gone. Satan, it's gone. But he said, no, I love everybody. So I'm going to let this whole thing play out. And I'm going to go die for them. And that's a crazy thing, because remember, the angels are looking into this. They don't understand it. How could God die? How could God do that? How could he make himself something else and then die for people that hate him? He didn't just go down there and die. He died because the people he went to go die for killed him in a vicious way. And people and, and, and angels are still, they, they, they can't wrap their heads around it. And we can't wrap our heads around it. And the thing is, we got to remember that in everything we do. The plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Let's read that again. But the plan of, the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. We think it's all about us, and it's not all about us. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be guarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. <clears throat> so the gospel is a universal thing. It was not just an earth, heaven thing. All right? This whole thing is being watched by everybody. And, th and they're watching it, and the reason they're watching it is because they don't understand it, like angels don't understand it, and like half of us don't understand it, but we know that God did it, and it's love, and we have to accept that. And from that, it motivates us to do everything we're supposed to do. That's why the first angel's message starts with the everlasting gospel. Then it tells us to fear God and give glory to him. Now she says this, should the inhabitants of this little world, she's talking about the earth, should the inhabitants of this little world refuse obedience to God, he would not be left without glory. He could sweep every mortal off the face of the earth in a moment and create a new race of, of people to glorify his name. God is not dependent on man for honor. He could marshal the starry host of heaven, the millions of worlds above, to raise a song of honor and praise and glory to their creator. So we got to stop being so big at it. God could just get rid of us. He has everything out there, but he still cares for us so much that he'll come to die for us. She also says, The sure ambassador of Christ is perfect union with him whom he represents. And his engrossing object is, to, uh, his engrossing object is the salvation of souls. The wealth of earth dwindles in insignificance when compared to the worth of a single soul for whom our Lord and Master died. He who weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in the balance regards a human soul as of infinite value. That's one person. That's the most horrible person you can think of. God says, Hitler. God says, uh, his, his soul is his value to me, is, 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 uh, is of infinite value. Worst people, the Pope. The, uh, not just any Pope. Just think of uh, the worst Pope you can think of. There's a lot of them. His soul, I died for him. Infinite value. If he was the only one to accept me, I would come to, if he was the only person on the earth, I would come down here to die for him. And she says, one soul is of more value to heaven than the whole than a whole world of property, houses, lands, and money. For the conversion of one soul, we shall tax our resources to the utmost. One soul, one to Christ, will flash heaven's light all around him, penetrating the moral darkness and saving other souls. So this is why I'm preaching this message. Because I understand this is a ministry that goes out and preaches the word of God and passes out the books and stuff. And that's all good, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. The Spirit of God is supposed to be doing it. But do you really have a love for what you're doing? Have you fallen into the motions? Just, okay, we come here, we do the studies, we talk, and then we pass out books, we bring this message. We, we got to get into the, the, the why you're doing it. I'm doing it because I, I'm not going to stand the stranger's door because his soul is of infinite value to me, because of infinite value to God. I love him, so I'm going to tell him about God. The thing is, the church doesn't really love people because the church doesn't love themselves. The church don't love the people in the church. The pastors don't love the people. The people don't love the pastors. And the people don't love the truth. Without love, this whole thing falls apart. And the motivating force behind love is that Christ died for us when you didn't have to. Now I say again, the value of a soul can be only measured by the risk. Now, what does this have to do with the third angel's message? I'll just turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14 and verse 6, talking about the three angels' messages. I wish I could do a whole sermon on the three angels' messages, but I can't. 
It says in verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to all them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The everlasting gospel is Christ coming to die for us, and it's everlasting because it was preordained before the world. All right? Saying with a loud voice, fear God. Fear God is always connected to keeping his commandments. True? Right. Mm -hmm. And fearing God is a profound respect. If you respect somebody, you do what they ask, right? right? And give glory to him. That's not praise and worship and dancing and saying glory to God. Glory to God is glory. First of all, do you have any glory to give? Does a human being have any glory to give? No. no, no, no. Only glory we have is the glory reflected through us through Jesus Christ. That's how you give glory to God. Character of Jesus Christ. And also it takes in your health message because you glorify God with your body. All right? For the hour of our judgment is come. That takes in our, our judgment message, which is unique to the seventh day of his church. And worship him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Again, a reference to the commandments and the fourth one in particular. And then the next, the next angel message is there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen in the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. If what we're teaching you in the first angel's message is not being taught where you're at, get out of there. Why? Because her wine, which is doctrines, false doctrines over in that sense, her wine is false. And what's happening if you stay there? What happens if you reject those, that, the, the first two messages? And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the saints are drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You know, that's mentioned before in the Bible, in the Gospels, when Jesus is praying. Jesus took the wine of the wrath of God. He drank it for everybody that would ever accept him, the whole world. The thing is, now time's cut short. When that third angel said, we're preaching that third angel's message because when time's done and the time of trouble starts, you're on, this, you're on the side you're on. All right? Whoever's holy, let him be holy still. Whoever's unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. He's not setting you in your ways. You're setting, you're, you stuck yourself in your ways, and you want to be that way. But God's saying, beware, because you'll drink that cup of wrath that Jesus drunk. Jesus experienced the second death in his first death. He, exp he, he experienced that, that separation from God. That's why he yelled out, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? God didn't forsake him, actually. He was actually there, but he felt that he was uh, just total aloneness. Nothing, no friends, no family, not even God on the cross, and he died because of sin, not because of the scars in his hands and his face. And he didn't die because of the, the, the physical torment. He died because of sins, because people don't die on the cross that fast. Okay? We'll drink that same wrath of God that Jesus had to drink, which is poured out without mixture, that's without mercy, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Who worship the beast in his image, whosoever received the mark of his name. So why is that important that we have to preach these messages, starting with Jesus, who is the center of all, of everything? Why is it important we have to preach that nowadays in particular? Why? Someone can answer anybody. Why is it important we preach this in context of what we're talking about? Because the message is a twofold message. If we're believers in Jesus, that makes our us stronger in Jesus. If we're an enemy of Jesus, it makes us stronger away from Jesus. Mm -hmm. God just wants everybody to make a decision. This is a message that forces people to make a decision. Yep, it does. No sitting on the fence. And by the way, this third angel's message is accompanied by the latter rain. Because right after this, we have him coming and he's reaping the earth. You reap the earth after the latter rain, right? Then your harvest is ripe. And it's most important that we preach this message in connection with Jesus. All right? I hear a lot of Seventh-day Adventists talk about the Sunday law, Sunday law, Sunday law, but they don't live a Christian lifestyle. They don't glorify God in their character. They don't, keep, they don't do the health message whatsoever. They don't talk about the judgment. They say there is no judgment. The 1844 thing, that's not true. There's no sanctuary in heaven. Seventh-day Adventists are saying that these days. I watched a pastor the other day start saying that. I just turned the sermon off. And he was teaching it. And he was smart. And it sounded right. But it wasn't. He had a pastor saying a whole lot of stuff, tearing down the three angels' message. Because what he was doing right there, he just, he just got rid of the whole first angel's message. Then we had Seventh-day Adventists come out, that like the, uh, like the dude that became, he was a Seventh-day Adventist and switched out of it, and he wrote the book, the, uh, the White Lie, and a few other books about the Sabbath uh, against our denomination, saying, well, you know, the Sabbath, is, you don't know, really keep the Sabbath because God never put an evening and a morning on the Sabbath. Or we don't keep the Sabbath because the Sabbath, God never commanded Adam and Eve to keep it. We don't got to keep it. It's not important. And he's a Seventh-day Adventist. People that people look and say, wait, you're a Seventh-day Adventist? Says, yeah, then look at us, little funny. Say they're tearing down the first angel's message, which is very important, and it's key. All right? That's what all the teaching is, all the Bible says we do. That's where it comes from, the first angel's message. That gets us to the third angel's message, and it'll come naturally. Sometimes you don't got to teach everybody. You, you do. But sometimes if you don't teach somebody all the three angel's messages, you just teach them the simple teachings of the Bible. 
which are all wrapped up in the first angel's message, when that time comes, what they heard, they didn't act on it, but what they heard, when that time comes and that Sunday law comes, they'll switch over. And all of a sudden, you see them in church, and you'll be out of church on the, other, on the wrong side. And you'll wonder how you got there. And the reason that we preach this with, with, with so much power, and we have to really go do it, even though the whole church as a whole isn't, is because we're in a war. All right? We're in a war, and in a war, there's, there's no... What, if you, what would you do if you went to war and you had no guns? What happened to you? You get shot up and you die. You couldn't protect yourself. The thing is, a lot of Adventists aren't protecting themselves. They're in the war with no guns. They're just running around. Some of them are just standing there. They're just sitting, some are sleeping. And Satan's side is going full force, and they're murdering as much as they can. Revelation 16. Go to Revelation 16. Revelation 16 and verse 13. It says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. That is the papacy, that is apostate Protestantism, and worldlings. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So it looks like the three of those messages on our side are gathering us to the great day of the battle of, the God, of God Almighty. And seeing our history was on his side doing the same thing. That's why it's important we teach it. Because if we don't preach our things, you know, pastors say don't talk about that stuff. Just talk about the love of God. And I, that my sermon was on the love of God. Jesus come die for us. And that's good. But what's that to do with the angel's message? What's that to do with present truth? Is it present truth? Yes, it's still present truth. Because it's the reason that we preach what we preach. You understand? And Satan knows this. And that's why Satan's coming out with his three angels' message. And that's the opposite of ours, obviously. His says, glorify God. His says, don't glorify God. Or says, do the health message. His says, don't do the health message. Since God came to die for us, he says that God was just a man. He was sinful. Pope was just talking about Jesus had to ask forgiveness of Mary. That would mean he had sinned. You see? And they, and, and they put other things up in front of Jesus, all these saints. And it's not just the Catholic Church. It's the whole world now because the whole world looks at the Pope like he's God. And they say, oh, I don't, I don't follow the Pope. I don't follow the Pope. So why did you, why'd you go over there to see him? Why are you so excited? Why are you clapping and cheering? Why are you saying, well, that's a great guy? If you're supposed to know the truth, you're supposed to be an Adventist. And I met Adventists like that. And it's because they don't read their Bibles. They don't study. They don't know what really happened. They don't know what God did for them. All right? And second angel's message of, of Satan's side is saying, if you're in Babylon, stay there. Everything you're doing is fine. It doesn't matter how you worship as long as you're in church. Praise God. That's all you got to do. Sing. Go to church. Dress up nice. And the third angel's message is saying, there's not going to be any type of hellfire. None of that's going to come true. You know, the Catholic Church doesn't believe in a second coming. They believe that there's going to be a millennium of peace on earth. So they're not looking forward to a second coming. They're not looking forward to a hellfire. They're looking forward to the second coming on earth. They say, if we can get the whole world on our side, there'll be a millennium of peace. And the whole world now seems like it's going right with the Pope and saying, yeah, you're right. We got to do that. And no one's worried about the second coming. And it's going to catch them all off guard. Mm -hmm. yeah. And right after that, in verse 15, he says it. Because I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. He comes like a thief. You know, a th People think that the coming as a thief is the second coming. It is the second coming, but not the thief part. Say you're in your house, right, and you're sleeping, 12 o'clock at night, because they always say the midnight cry, so it's 12 o'clock at night. You're sleeping, and the thief sneaks into your house, and he steals your TV, and he leaves. Now you're sleeping. Did you know he stole the TV? Did you know it? No, but when you wake up, you see that he stole the TV. You understand? The coming as a thief is a clues of probation. That'll close first. People think, oh, time of trouble. Or, or the, I mean, the people say, oh, the, the, the second coming. But they forget. There's a probation closing and there's a time of trouble. They forget about that. They think about the second coming and don't fix their lives. And then, time of, then when probation shuts, see, Satan, all, all Satan got to do is hold you over. Say, oh, just hold on to that one sin. Just li let it linger, let it linger, let it linger. And when probation shuts, he's like, I got him. That one little sin that you thought wouldn't get you out of heaven will, get you in, will, will, uh, will ruin you. You understand? And it also goes into whatever you do now, the small sins, because I don't believe anybody here, well, there's all big sins. All sins are big sins. But pet sins, little sins that people think aren't that bad. Mm -hmm. And we all got them. Mm -hmm. That will get you the mark of the beast. You think, I would never worship on Sunday. You will. See, all, all that happens right now is you say, I keep the Sabbath. I just buy a burger on Friday night. You know, if it, that buying a burger on Friday night is breaking the Sabbath. And that little, little bit, that little type of, I'm not going to break out of that one little thing will bring you to mark of the beast. Because if you don't do it now, why would you do it then? Mm -hmm. it's a, in love, it's the little things that count. We know that, right? So it's the little things that count. The little sins God wants you to get rid of. The big sins, oh, Seventh-day Adventists don't do the big sins. As uh, far as we know, that people can see. You know, I don't see murderers in the church and people that are fornicating and doing all this nice stuff and cussing at them out in the church. I see a bunch of good godly people. It seems as though. But we all got sins in our minds and in the back closet. And we got to get rid of those. Or else, or else Jesus death meant nothing for us. Understand? 
and we made that god that came down to this little planet, this little admiral planet, to die for at least one person, useless for us in our case. He gave you the tickets, he's, he's having a party, and he gave you the tickets, and he paid for the tickets. He said, all you got to do is come, and you don't want to come. You understand? It's sad. And last, I want to talk about, um, in context with this, it's evangelism, because we do, evan we, this, this whole thing, it, you know, is about evangelism and spreading God's truth. It's not going to mean anything if you save a thousand people and you lose yourself. Okay? That's scripture. So we have to all dwell on this fact. We got to go back to the, the, the first love. We got to think about that. And I'm glad he said that today. It was perfect for the message because we got to really dwell on what Jesus did for us. Do we really love God or do we just love what we're, what we're doing? Do I love wearing a suit and going and knocking on doors? And do I like giving Bible studies? Do I like preaching? Or do you really just love Jesus? And that's why you do why you're doing what you're doing. Do you love Jesus? Do you love the Lord? And not just I, I love Jesus as in saying it. Do you love God in your actions? Do you actively love God? He actively loved us. Do we actively love him? And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing me here today. Thank you for this message. Um, humble us and help us to remember that you did die for us and that it wasn't just something that happened. It was special and it was important and it was the biggest thing that happened in the universe. Help us to realize that we're not much compared to everything you have, but that we understand that you came to die for us and we're ready and accepting to live the way you want us to live because of that. Help us in our evangelism, spreading the three angels message, and help us to remember the love of God, and help us to put that in the three angels message, and not separate the love of God from the doctrines that we're supposed to teach. Help the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Help us do what the spirit of prophecy in the Bible tells us to do in these last days. Help us to fight against Satan's counterfeit three angels message. Help us to fight against the beast, the false prophet, and the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon, and help us to be the Christians you want us to be. Help us to get into the Bible and study, and study for ourselves, and dig deeper into the stuff that we already know about, because it's, it keeps going, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for having me.